able to save our very souls, Lord God. And Father, I just give you glory, honor, and praise, Lord God, that as I minister to your people, as I teach your people your word, Lord, that they will receive and be able to understand what the spirit of the living God is saying and that they will be able to apply this to their life, Lord God. And I thank you and I praise you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, glory to God. Hallelujah. Welcome, 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 everyone, to another Words of Wisdom Bible Study. Glory to God. God is an awesome God, and I thank each one of you for joining in tonight. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So we're going to dive right in, and we're going to um, go to Romans chapter 2. But before we um, go to Romans, we're going to make the declaration to ourselves, and we're going to make the declaration to the spiritual realm because we mean business tonight. We're going to learn what the spirit of the living God is saying, and we're going to learn how we should behave according to God's law, according to his word. Oh, God, I just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, God. You get glory, God, out of this, Lord. Hallelujah, God. You get all the glory. So as you get out your Bible, whether it's your paper Bible, whether it's your Android device, whether it's your iPhone, your iPad, whatever your love letter is on, I ask that you would get it out. And as you're getting out your love letter, as you're getting out your Bible, I ask that you would get out paper and pencil or paper and pen so that you can write down what the Spirit of the living God will say to you tonight. Because how many know that God is always speaking, but we're not always listening? And tonight we're going to command our minds to be lined up and in tune with God's voice so that we can hear his voice. We're going to command our body. We're going to command our minds to stay focused in this Bible study. We're going to ask the Lord that he will just filter out all of the noise and the distractions that may be around us so that we can concentrate and hear what he's saying. Amen. So as you hold up your Bible and we're going to make the declaration to ourselves and to the spiritual realm that this is my Bible. This is my love letter from my heavenly father. And I have what he says I have. I can do what he says I can do. Tonight I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert and my heart is receptive and I will never be the same. Never, 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 never be the same in Jesus name. Amen. To God be all glory, honor, and praise. Hallelujah. So today we're going to start with Romans. We're at Romans chapter two. Romans chapter two. And we're going to start with verse 17. And I'm reading the New King James Version. And when I get into expounding on his word on each uh, line by line, I will venture out and I will use another um, translation of the Bible. I will use the Amplified and some of the verses as I go back into and expound. So Romans chapter 2, verse 17, and I'm reading the New King James Version. And it says, Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor or hate idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you as it is written. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. God is an awesome God. Thank you, Lord. Sorry, I had to turn on another light so I can see a little bit better. So verse 17 says, Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God. So Paul is telling us, and we know that Paul is the one who is talking to us. And he's saying that these Jews that he's speaking to, with that he's talking about, he says they talk with pride and self-satisfaction because they were born a Jew. See, those in some Jews believe that because they are Abraham's uh, lineage of Abraham's lineage, that 
they are automatically set to go to heaven. It doesn't matter what they do or how they act. They believe that they were automatically going to heaven because they were born a Jew. But we all know that this is not right. And, and we've talked about that previously. So these people, these Jewish leaders, these people, they knew the right words to say. And they even looked religious. They knew how to wear the right clothes and do the right things. And they knew how to look religious to others. But on the inside, they did not have a change of heart. So these people, he Paul says, I know, indeed, I know that you are a Jew and that you rest on the law, that you stand firm on the law, that you believe in the law and you make your boast in God, that you talk of, of pride. You talk with pride or arrogancy and self-satisfaction about your lineage, about you being a Jew. He says, I understand all those things. See, when these same Jewish people were coming to John the Baptist, when he was out there baptizing people, the Holy Spirit revealed to him what their issue was or what they were doing, why they were coming. And he saw when they came to the baptism of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, John said, you brood of vipers. He says, who warned you to flee from the divine wrath and judgment to come? And then he told them, in other words, in this next verse, he's going to say in Matthew 3, verse 8, he's telling them, if you want to escape the wrath and judgment that is coming, this is what you got to do, he said. So he said, produce fruit that is consistent with repentance. That means they must demonstrate new behavior that proves a change of heart and a conscious decision to turn away from sin. And that even goes for us. We can wear the right clothes. We can wear anything that we want to make us look religious. We can put on a religious look on our face. We can have this look that we are so holy. We can talk the right talk. We can say the right things. We can shout at the right time. We can dance at the right time. We can have the perfect dance move um, when you're dancing in the church. But see, what actually matters to God is, do you have a change of heart? Did you come and receive Jesus as a Lord and as your Lord and Savior? Did you repent of your sins? He says, indeed, I know that you are Jew. Or I know that you're black. Or I know that you're white. Or I know that you're whatever nationality that you are. And I know that you believe the law and that you even try to operate in the law, but you have not repented. You make your boast in God. You say that you're a Christian. You say that you're uh, operating according to the law of God, but you have not repented. You have not given your life to the Lord. So then in verse eight of Matthew three, he said, John the Baptist said, so produce fruit that is consistent with repentance demonstrating new behavior that proves a change of heart. See, when you have an actual change of heart, when you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you gonna, it's going to show in your actions. You're going to have the fruit that demonstrates that you have a change of heart and that you have consciously turned away from sin. And then he tells us in Matthew, same chapter, chapter 3, verse 9, he says, And do not presume to say to yourself as a defense, Oh, we have Abraham for our father. So our inheritance assures us of salvation. See, this is what the Jews were saying. He says, for I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children. He's able to raise up descendants from, for Abraham. And then he tells them that already the ax, that means God's judgment, is swinging toward or is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So it doesn't matter what nationality you are. It doesn't matter what race you are. What matters is do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? See, these Jews, they believe that they were made righteous by keeping the law. That's what their belief was. And they frequently, many times, misinterpreted the law. They would change the law based on their own circumstances or based on how they wanted people to follow them or come up under their rule or their thumb, so to speak. So these people, they kept many of the traditions that they thought were equal to the scripture, that they thought had just as much authority as the scriptures itself had. So they kept different traditions, such as the tradition of circumcision. Circumcision is good for the health, but there must be a circumcision of the heart. So these Jews were hypocrites because they ignored the spiritual parts of the law. 
They did what they wanted to do. They interpreted the way they wanted to interpret it. And that's the same thing that's happening today in the world. There are many people that are interpreting the scripture according to their own lifestyle, according to the way they want to live their sinful life. They're interpreting the scriptures according to themselves, but they're not allowing the spirit of the living God to tell them exactly what that scripture means and how to apply it to their life. So their religion is in vain because they're not followers of Christ. They are actually enemies of the cross. So these Jews, they were more concerned about how they appear in the eyes of people. And that's how it is today. Many of the churches and denominations now are more concerned about how they appear to the people. And they're trying to make sure everybody comes into the fold, make sure everybody comes to church. So they're bending the rules. They're bending scriptures. They're interpreting the way that they think that it should be interpreted so that they can bring people in but yet they're not telling the people you've got to have a change of heart you've got to receive jesus as your lord and savior see we are not saved and you're not saved by who you know you're not saved by your family affiliation you're not saved by your ethnic group or your race but your confession of who Jesus is and repenting of your sins. So Paul is telling us, don't think that you are saved because of your family, what your family has done, that your family, some of your family members are saved or some of your family members confess faith. He says, you're not even saved by the denomination that you confess to be in, nor are you saved by your religious rituals. It doesn't matter that these these same Jews were going to Jerusalem once a year to participate participate in the ceremonies. It didn't matter about that. It didn't matter that they were circumcised, the men were circumcised in the flesh. It didn't matter about that. What mattered was, have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Hallelujah. See, these Jews were putting their confidence in their lineage and their social and religious position. That's what their confidence was in. Their confidence wasn't in faith in God. Their confidence is in what they could do, who they knew, or how people saw them. They were arrogant and they were proud. Then in verse 18 of Romans chapter 2, verse 18, it says, I know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. So these people, I'm going to read 17 and then I'm going to read 18 again. It says, indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. So my amplified version says this, and if you claim to know his will and discerningly distinguish between the things that are different and you approve the things that are essential or excellent or have a sense of what is excellent based on instruction from the law. So these Jews, they knew God's will. They knew the will of God. They were given and taught scripture from a little child. They were always taught what the scripture was saying. So they were approved of these things. They were even instructed out of the law. Then in verse 19, it says, and are confident or positive that you yourself are a guide, a G-U-I-D-E, which is a guiding light to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. So anybody who reads this, these verses needs to think about their relationship their vocation or profession in the body of Christ. See, all of us are given a job to do in the body of Christ. We're all given a task. So whatever your job is, regardless of whether it's cleaning the bathrooms, whether it's picking up paper, whether it's calling someone to encourage them, whether regardless of what it is, every job, every vocation, every profession in the body of Christ is important. And you should not think that what you do in the body of Christ is insignificant because it does matter. So these people know God's will. They knew God's will. They knew his law. And it says they even approved of the spiritual things of God because they are instructed by God's law. But yet many of them, many of these Jews did not apply what they knew according to the law of God to their life. See, it is your faith 
and transformation through Jesus and not the outside that is important to God. See, it doesn't matter that you put on all of this um, all of this apparel, that you wear all of these religious garments, that you have your sleeves down to your hand and your, your dresses down to your ankles, or that you know how to dress according to the way you think a religious person is supposed to dress. Because you can be dressed perfect religiously, but on the inside, you could be dark. Your heart could be dark. You, you may not be saved. And see, you can look good, but you're going to die a sinful death. So faith and transformation through Jesus is what's important. These religious Jews, see, they kept the rituals that they wanted to keep. They made sacrifices. They performed the cleansing and washings according to the law. They were circumcised. They wore special clothing. They went to meetings. They went yearly um, to Jerusalem to participate in the various ceremonies. They even memorized large sections of of the Old Testament, they would even argue and debate with you what the scripture said. And they even tried to make proselytes, which means they tried to convert the Greeks or the non-Jewish people to Judaism or to their religion to follow um, after the Bible. But yet this is what Matthew 23, 15 says. Matthew 23, 15, Jesus says, Woe to you, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, frauds, pretenders, phonies, because you travel over sea and land to make a single proselyte, which means they travel great distances to convert people to Judaism. And then he says, and when he becomes a convert, when he converts to Judaism, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. In other words, you feed these people that are converted with your religious traditions, with your own interpretations of scripture. So you make them twice as much a son of hell. You make them twice as much a son of the devil as you are. So that's what he's saying. So then in verse 20, he says, an instructor or mentor of the foolish, the unwise, a teacher obeys, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. So these hypocrites are the same as the Gentiles without the law because they had the law, but these Jews were not following the law. See, they knew and they taught the law, but they did not keep the law. They didn't apply it to their own lives, but yet they were the type of people that would judge other people, that would see someone else not doing what scripture said and they would point it out and they would try to condemn that person but yet they wouldn't apply that same verse or that same law to their very own life they were just like the man in james in james chapter one who looked into the scripture and saw what manner of man or woman they were and then they walked away and forgetting what they even looked like they forgot that the scripture says do not steal they forgot that the scripture says, do not commit fornication or adultery. They forgot all of these things because when they walked away from the scripture, they forgot that what they actually saw that they read was their reflection of themselves. The law was telling them, these are the things that you're doing that are sinful. So James 1 says, James 1 verse 23 says this, for if anyone only listens to the word without obeying it, he is like a man who looks very carefully at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgets what he looked like. But he who looks carefully into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and faithfully abides by it, not having become a careless listener who forgets but an active doer who obeys, he will be blessed and favored by God in what he does in his life of obedience. That was James chapter 1, verses 23, 24, and 25. So when we look into scripture, don't forget what you saw when you read the scripture. When you read scripture, God will often highlight something, spiritually highlight something, that you need to abide by that you may not be doing. So he will highlight things. It's almost as if sometimes the words will kind of jump off of the page 
to let you know, hey, to flag you and get your attention. Hey, this is what you're not doing. This is what you need to be doing. This is where you're falling short and you need to repent of this. You need to walk circumspectly. You need to walk upright. You need to repent of your sin. Then in Matthew 23, verses uh verse 13, Matthew 23, verse 13, well, starting with verse 1, it says, Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples. And this is what he said. He said, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves. So in other words, he's saying they put, they put themselves in these seats. Some people put themselves up on a pedestal. Some people put themselves in the pulpit. Some people start their own churches. Some people begin different things. They've started it themselves. It's not that God led them, but they started it themselves. That's why you see that sometimes people in the churches, they may get offended if somebody else comes in the church. They may even say something to that person. If the church if what they are doing is really of God, then God will handle whatever comes. God will lead God us and direct us in wisdom so that we can address whatever we think that may be wrong or in error. When we go to God and ask him, he will reveal these things to us. So he said these scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves. They sat their own self in Moses' chair, meaning the chair of authority as teachers of the law. And then Jesus said, so practice and observe everything they tell you. He says, everything that the Pharisees and the scribes tell you to do, he says, do those things, but do not do as they do. Do not mimic their actions for they preach things, but do not practice them. He says, they preach the right things, but they don't practice what they preach. Then down in verse 19, Jesus says in the same chapter of Matthew 23, he says, you spiritually blind men. He says, which is more important? He, he's ask, asking them what is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering. And then he says in verse 23, he says, woe to you self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. He said, you hypocrites, for you give a tenth tithe of your mint deal coming focusing on minor matters and have neglected the weightier or the more important moral and spiritual provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the primary things you ought to have done without neglecting the others. See, they're telling everybody else to do these things, but yet they're not applying it to their lives. And then in verse 24, he calls them. He says, you spiritually blind guys. He's letting them know. He says, you strain out at a gnat, consuming yourself with minuscule matters and swallow a camel, which means ignoring and violating God's precepts. Then he tells them, he says, woe to you, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. He says, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate but inside they are full of extortion and robbery and self-indulgence, which is unrestrained greed. So he's he's reading these scribes and Pharisees, and he's also telling us what to, what to observe and what to look for in ourselves and what to observe and look for also in others, because you don't want to be following somebody who is self-indulging, who is um, prideful, who is arrogant, who is in their own way, can't even get out of their own way, who are spiritually blind. Then he tells them, he says, woe to you, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He keeps calling them hypocrites, trying to get their attention. He says, hypocrites, you pretenders, you fakes, you phonies, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside. He says, "On the, if you've ever seen a tombstone or one that has just been recently erected, they are beautiful. There are no stains on them. They're, and then if you compare them to some that has been there for years and years and years, you will see the difference and know the difference of the ones that just got put out. So he's saying, you scribes you and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you whitewashed tombs, what looks beautiful on the outside. He said, you're beautiful on the outside. You do all the right things. You dress appropriately. But inside, you are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. He said, on the inside, he said, your inside is black, is dark, is, is unregenerated because you have not repented. 
See, they had the form of knowledge. They had the law, which was a gift from God to the nation of Israel. It was a God's gift to them. But possessing the law does not justify or excuse a person for doing what's wrong or for sinning. Then in verse 21, it says, You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourselves? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? So Paul is saying, what are you doing with what you hear? When you hear these words, when you read the word of God, when you hear these things, what do you do with what you hear? See, you can sit in Bible study. You can sit Sunday after Sunday in church. You can even go to the weekday services. You can do all of these things. But if you do not apply what you hear, it does you no good. If you do not search the scriptures on your own after I've taught you tonight, if you haven't written these things down, these scriptures, and go back and search the scriptures on your own to see if what I'm telling you is correct, if it is indeed God's word, then it is doing you no good. Then he says, you who teach another, do you not teach yourself? So I'm teaching you, but I have to teach myself first. I have to allow the spirit of the living God to teach me first or else I'm a hypocrite because I'm telling you things that should be done. But if I don't follow them, then I'm a hypocrite and I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to hear God say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't want to hear him say, depart from me, you hypocrite, you pretender. You sound, you said the right things. You taught the right things. You preached the right things, but you did not teach yourself. You did not apply those things to yourself. I don't want to hear him say, depart from me. I never knew you. So these people had the law, but they did not keep it. They could see others break the law, even point out to the people that they're breaking the law or they're in sin. But they did not see how they were breaking the law. They refused to see that they were a sinner, that they were sinning just as much as the person who they were pointing the error or the sin out to. We have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean that you're working to earn your salvation, but what it means is that you obey the word of God, that you apply what you've read and what you know to your life. Paul says that In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, he says, Just as you have always obeyed my instructions with enthusiasm, not only in my presence, because see, there were some people that, and there are people still today that will obey the word of God while they're in the presence of other people that are watching them. But he says, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. That means, he says, to cultivate it, Bring it to full effect. Actively pursue spiritual maturity. That means to actively seek God's word. Actually study to so show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed. Applying God's word to your life. Seeking his face daily. And he says, with all inspired fear and trembling. Using serious caution, in other words. And critical self-evaluation to avoid anything that might offend God or discredit the name of Christ. That's how we work out our salvation, by doing what we know is right to do, by self-examination, -exam self-evaluation, and to avoid anything that might offend God or that might discredit the name of Christ. Verse 22, you who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor or hate idols, do you rob temples? See, Jesus accused the Jews of adultery. And in the Old Testament, we are told that whenever they started going after other guys, because God said He was he's married to Israel, he's married to them. So when they started going after other gods, that means they were committing spiritual adultery. That was as if they were actually fornicating or having a sexual relation in the spiritual realm with these um, little G-O-D-S's. They were going after these little G-O-D-S's. This was adultery. 
And then in Matthew 12, the Jews, the ones that he was talking to, they said, well, show us a sign. In other words, prove to us who you are. You said that you're Jesus. You said that you're the son of God. You said that you're the Messiah. Show us a sign. Show us something that we can physically see. We hear what you're saying, but in order for us to believe who you are, you need to show us a sign. Show us what you got, in other words. So he said, you are an adulterous generation. See, in those days, there were teachers who actually taught that a man could divorce his wife for any reason. Didn't really have to have a reason. He could divorce her because he didn't like her cooking, just because he wanted to marry someone else. So he could divorce. The wife couldn't divorce the husband, but the husband could divorce the wife in those days. So Paul is pointing out to them that they are, as well as Jesus, that they are an adulterous generation. So he's saying to them, do not commit, a, do you say to others, do not commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols or hate idols, do you rob the temples? In other words, do you rob the temples of these pagan gods? Do you go and make profit from them by stealing what is in their temple? Jesus told them when they asked him to show them a sign, he says, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Remember what happened to Jonah? Jonah was trying to run away from his assignment that God had, had given him, and he got on the boat. He paid his own fare, and when he got out the sea, the sea became angry and started tossing the boat up and down and Jonah said just throw me over because this the reason why the sea is acting this way is because of me because I'm basically running from my assignment um, that God has given me so he said no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah the prophet Jonah was was made obedient so to speak he chose to become obedient after he was in the belly of the fish for three nights. He chose to become obedient. So he says, no sign is going to be given except for Jonah the prophet. But the thing with this is those, these people that are not following God, that are saying all these things that want a sign, the only sign that they're going to be given, it may be when they enter into an eternal damnation, when they're in the belly of the earth, and then they will not be able to repent. Then in verse 23, it says, You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? See, these Jews, they put their hope in the law, in the law of God, and their own abilities to keep the law. This is where their hope was. But the law was given to them. They were taught the law. But well, Jesus says that I'm not even going to be the one that's going to accuse you before my father. You've been breaking the law, but I'm not even going to be the one who accused you. But the one who you have put your hope in, Moses, he's the one that's going to accuse you before the father because you didn't keep the law. John 5, 45, Jesus says, do not think that I will accuse you before the father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. Matthew 15, he says, Jesus replied to them, he says, Why also do you violate the commandment of God for the sake of your traditions handed down by the elders? See, there was many traditions that had been handed down, and these were verbal traditions that these Jews were trying to keep. They honored or upheld these verbal traditions versus the law of God, the written law of God. So they were willing to follow the traditions, but only pick and choose what they wanted to follow out of God's law. But yet they would point their finger at you or at me if I violated the law. Then Jesus tells them in, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 7, he says, you hypocrites, you play actors, pretenders. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honor me with their lips. They had all the right words to say, 
But then Jesus says, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, for they teach as doctrines the precepts of men. So he said the precepts, the verbal traditions of men. He said, these are the things that they preach. They try to tell you to do these things, but yet they don't preach the whole counsel of God like they should. Because when they preach, they try to give their own interpretations. In Micah chapter 3, verse 11, Micah 3, verse 11, says her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe. In other words, these leaders, they give judgment based on what is given to them, the money that's given to them or the land or the property or whatever. So her leaders, Israel leaders produce judgment for a bribe. Her priests teach for a fee. And that's happening now. People are preaching and teaching and they expect you to give them X amount of dollars and they'll even tell you, give this. And we were at a church one time where the person, the preacher said, If you don't have X amount of dollars to give, this amount to give, then don't bring your money up here. In other words, I don't want your money. If you can't give, let's say it was $100. If you can't give $100, then don't give anything because it is useless. So her priests teach for a fee, according to Micah 3.11. And then it says, and her prophets foretell for money. There was a prophet that used to be on TV, and he used to prophesy and say that if you want me to give you a prophecy, this is how much money you got to send me. And then I will prophesy over your life. So her prophets foretell for money, yet they lean on the Lord saying, is not the Lord among us? No tragedy or distress will come on us. And that's what many of people in the world is saying today. They're saying because they have continued in their sin, because they're letting all of these things take place in the church, these cross dressers and 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 all of these people come and sing in the church and have concerts when they know that they're not right with the Lord when they know they haven't repented they can actually see because if you have repented it's going to show in your lifestyle but these people are saying because no tragedy has come upon them or distress that the Lord is among them but that is not so See, God allows us, gives us so much time to get our life in order. He ministers to us. He woos us to him. He tries to, he convicts us of our sin to woo us to him, to cause us to repent. But just because judgment isn't executed speedily, that does not mean judgment won't be coming. But God is just so merciful. He's so gracious that he tries to allow us to get it right. Because in his word, he tells us that he wished that none would perish, but all would come into the knowledge of the truth. So God does not want anybody to perish. He's even told us that hell was not created for humans. Hell was created for Satan and the fallen angels. He says, I didn't make hell for my created humans, but there are so many that will reject and have rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior, and because they have rejected them, then hell will be their eternal destination. That's why the Bible tells us that hell enlarges itself to receive more souls. Hell gets bigger and bigger. Even while we're sitting here, thousands of people have entered into hell, and it enlarges itself to accept those souls. Don't let that be you. Don't be the one that hell accepts. Repent of your sin today and ask Jesus into your life. Don't keep sinning on credit. In other words, don't keep sinning and laying up for yourself what's going to be damnation in the end. Repent of your sin and turn away. There's nothing on this earth that should cause you not to repent to the Lord. There's nothing good enough. There's no man or woman. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of job. There's nobody that should cause you to not repent. Because if you don't repent, you can't stand before God and say, because I was in love with this person, that's why I didn't repent. Because I love my job, that's why I didn't repent. Because this person said that I had time, that's why I didn't repent. There is no amount of excuses that you could ever come up with that will cause God to change his mind once you once his breath leaves your body and you enter in into eternity i'm pleading with you lord jesus i'm pleading with you and you know who you are hallelujah you know that you're sinning 
and you know that you're living in sin. You need to repent because this may be the last opportunity that you have to ask Jesus to forgive you for your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and to be your Lord and Savior. And it's not just verbalizes, but it's also your heart, your action. What are you going to do once you speak it out of your mouth? Thank you, Father. Verse 24 says, for the, and I, it's, it's, Lord Jesus, I don't know who it is specifically, but God is pouring out to you and he's warned you to repent. If you don't repent, this may be your last day, your last opportunity. And it would break my heart to see you on this line and know that you died in your sin. That would break my heart. So repent of your sins. It's no form or fashion. All you got to do is say, Jesus, I am a sinner and I need a savior. I know that you died for my sin. I know that you are the son of God. I know that you are the Messiah. I ask you to cleanse me of my sin and all unrighteousness. I choose you to be my Lord and my savior. And I welcome you into my life. Create in me a clean, pure heart and renew a right spirit within me. And Father, I thank you for being my father now. And I thank you, Jesus, for being my Lord. And my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I pray that you said those words or something along that line. And that it came from your heart. Because that's what God sees the heart. So verse 24. Thank you, Father. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. So verse 24 says, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you as it is written. So Paul is telling these Jews, he's saying that God's name is blasphemed because of you, because of the, the way you're acting, because you say one thing, but you do another. So because of you, if you're on this line and you know that you have not been living according to your confession according to what you have spoken out of your mouth and others have seen you not living according to what you said, then they will blaspheme God's name because of you, because of your lifestyle. So these Jews talk the right stuff, but they didn't live according to the standards of God. That's why the Gentiles, those who are non-Jews, that's why they blaspheme God's name because they saw these people saying one thing and living totally different. So it doesn't matter how much education you have. It doesn't matter whether you have, have a theological degree. If you don't know God, God of the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, if you don't know the God of the Holy Scriptures, if you don't have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ, his son, you will never know the real and true meaning of the scriptures that are written about Jesus. See, you can't be taught this stuff in theological school. They can teach you what they think the word says. But if you don't have a real relationship with Jesus, you will never be able to understand what the scripture actually says. He says that you'll be forever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. See, it's just like if you have a vehicle, let's say you have a, a Ford or a Chevy or Acura or Lexus or something like that. Say you have a vehicle and you're about to go and work on that vehicle. So whatever vehicle you have, you go and get a manual that is not for that vehicle. Say I have an Acura. And I go and get a, a manual for a Chevy. And I try to apply what's in that manual to my Acura. It is not going to work because that manual was not made for that vehicle. So even if I go and get the parts that they said go on the Chevy and try to put it on my Acura, it is not going to work. That's how it is with scripture. You can read the scripture and then you can try to apply it to your life, but it's not going to work because... You don't know the author of the scripture. You have no relationship with the God of the scripture. 
Thank you, Lord. Then in verse 25, it says, For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So remember, circumcision is on the eighth day, the male child was supposed to be circumcised, which means that their private part, the skin was supposed to be cut off of their private part. They were supposed to be circumcised. And this is the covenant that God gave to Abraham. This was a covenant relationship to say that these people, that the child had been set apart for God, that they had been dedicated to God. That's what circumcision is. And circumcision is good for the health, but it is of no value in our salvation for our salvation. Circumcision was to show that these Jews were set apart as a nation for God, that these men, so that they could remember not to participate in the rituals of the other people, the other godless people, the other people that were not serving God. They wanted to participate in the rituals of other nations. He's telling us a circumcision is profitable if you keep the law, but who can keep the law if men were able to keep the law? If you break one, then you are guilty of all. So if men were able to keep the law, there would have been no reason for Jesus to come and die for our sin. But because we could not keep the law, that's the reason why Jesus came to die for our sin. See, there's some Jews that protest that salvation is based on them being a descendant of Abraham. And they said, we can even show you that we're descendants of Abraham because we can show you proof that we've been circumcised. But Paul is telling them that that's irrelevant in regard to justification. That's irrelevant in regard to forgiveness of sin. See, it doesn't matter what the physical outside looks like. What matters is what's on the inside. You can be circumcised on the outside, but if your heart has been uncircumcised, if your heart has not been circumcised, if your heart has not been given to Jesus, then it is of none effect. Deuteronomy 10, verse 16. Deuteronomy 10, verse 16. We may go over a little bit. If you have to jump off, I understand. But I would like to uh, finish this chapter tonight. Deuteronomy 10, verse 16 says, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked or rebellious no longer. See, circumcision is done within. It's done on the inside as well as without meaning that it is to be done spiritually as well as physically because we know that physically with a man who is circumcised it is good for the health for the health of that male child so circumcision must be done on the inside it is a sign of dedication to the lord it's a sign that we have dedicated ourselves to the lord but if you don't have a change of heart it doesn't matter what is done on the outside because it's the inside that counts. Deuteronomy 30 verse 6. Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. So circumcision, even in the Old Testament, they were stressing the prophets and they were stressing to be circumcised in your heart. Circumcision of the heart will be proven by the fruit of your life. And that's what John the Baptist was telling them, that to the Pharisees and those and the Sadducees, those who were coming, those Jews who were coming to the baptism, he was telling them, bring, bring forth fruit to show that you have truly repented, show that your heart has been circumcised. He said, bring forth fruit of that. Just like with food, let's say you go to the store and on the outside of the box, it says um, cornflakes or some other brand, um, corn or, or asparagus or whatever on the outside of the box or the can. And, it, and that's what you went to the store for. You went to the store to get that particular vegetable and or that particular cereal and you get that home. And when you get at home to sit down to have that particular item and you open it up 
and then on the inside it's something totally different than what the outside said say you wanted um some type of cornflakes but on the inside you see something that looked fruity or looked like fruit loops or some other type of cereal or you get on open up your can of asparagus and on the inside is corn see it doesn't matter what the label says on the outside it's what's on the inside that matters. So people are label, labeling themselves as Christians, but on the inside, they are far away from Christ because Christians, people were first called Christians in Antioch. That was when they first started calling people followers of Christ Christians because when they looked at them, they said, you look just like Christ. You act just like Christ. So they began calling them Christians. And many people are labeling themselves as Christians because that is... Uh, like the national religion of the United States, that Christianity is a national religion. And many people say that they're Christians, but their lives are far away from Christianity. They are so far away from the cross that it's ridiculous. But yet they call themselves Christians. They label them own selves as Christians. Verse 26 says, therefore, if, and that's a big if, an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law. That's if, if, if he keeps. In other words, if he can even keep the righteousness of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? So even though he is not circumcised in the flesh, wouldn't that be counted as circumcision because he kept the law? That's what Paul is saying. See, the ritual of circumcision does not save. Neither does baptism. Many people have been baptized and people have baptized people not knowing whether they have even confessed to be saved, not knowing whether they have even repented of their sins, not knowing that they're even followers of Christ, but they baptize them because they asked to be baptized. So all they did was go down a, a dry center and come up a wet center. There's no change in their life. All they were doing was the ritual of baptism. So only your confession of faith and who Jesus is and your repentance of your own sins will matter. So you can't repent for somebody else's sin. Your own sins is what you got to repent of. So keeping the law could not save. That is why Jesus came. We must be obedient to the word of God, to what God tells us that he is saying. See, circumcision becomes a useless ritual unless the person develops an obedient heart that completely, that is completely submitted to God. God judges us according to what's on the inside. He judges us according to our heart. He judges us according to our heart and why we did what we did. What was your motive when you did that thing? What were you planning on doing what he looks at the heart that's why people can say a lot of things people confess to be christians but then you sit back and watch their lifestyle you watch the things they do and then you will see that they're so far away from christ that it's not even funny so paul is demolishing the self-righteousness of the jews who base their worthiness before god on their works they're basing it on their lineage that they're children of abraham they're basing it on the works that they do Then in verse uh, 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, not what is written, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So circumcision of the physical body is of no value because God looks at the heart. He wants an outward demonstration of what has already taken place in our heart. Circumcision symbolizes separ separateness from the world and consecration to God. So when our hearts are circumcised, when you repent, God circumcises our heart. He changes our heart. He renews our heart. He takes out the stony heart and gives us a heart of flesh. On the inside, we're created and we're made a new creation because of our confession. And Galatians 6 verse 15 says, For neither is circumcision anything, 
or of any importance, nor uncircumcision, but only a new creation, which is a result of a new birth, a spiritual transformation, a new nature in Christ Jesus. See, under the new covenant, we become circumcised of the heart. Our heart is circumcised. So having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, sacrifice, and offering of salvation, it means a lot. That is more weightier than being circumcised in the flesh. What matters is the heart and being a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ that is grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he is a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. See, it's all done by the Holy Spirit, not our works, but by the Holy Spirit. He does the changing on the inside, which will show on the outside, which will show in our works, which will show in our behavior. The old things, which means the previous moral and spiritual condition that we once had before the Holy Spirit came in, have passed away. Behold, new things have come because there is a spiritual awakening that brings a new life. That's the Amplified Version. Jeremiah cried out in Jeremiah 4.4. He says, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long will your evil thoughts lodge or live within you? So he was crying out and he's still crying out today saying, how long will you continue down that road of sin? How long will you continue in the evil and wickedness? How long will you do these things? And by him saying, wash your heart. See, in the Old Testament, there was, if you read in uh, Leviticus and Numbers, the cleansing that they're talking about was a cleansing of a garment. It was washing, getting the stain out of the garment or the impurity or whatever defiled that garment. So that's what he's saying. Wash your heart, cleanse your heart. And the only way to cleanse your heart is through the word of God. It's through the repentance of your heart. It's an honest repentance and asking the Lord to be your Lord and Savior. Isaiah 1 says God wants to save you, but only if you exercise your free will and accept his invitation of salvation. And Isaiah, this is what he says. He says, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you got to be willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if, if you resist, resist and rebel, rebel, you will be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So if you're living in rebellion, you're hearing these teachings. If you're rejecting these teachings, you will be swallowed by the sword. Then he says in the verse, he says, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So praise from God is not by keeping external rituals. But praise from God comes to those who are obedient to God's word, who seek after him, who seeks to glorify him, who does not seek to for your own glory, but seeks to glorify him in sincerity and truth. So we got to evaluate ourselves, y'all. We got to evaluate ourselves by the scripture and not be too hasty to correct, to correct, to correct others. And to rely on God by being quick to repent of our sin. We got to rely on God. We got to be quick to repent of our sins. Every time the thought comes to your mind, repent. Even every day, just repent. Just constantly repent. Whether you think you did something wrong or not, repent. Ask God to show it to you. Ask him to show him your sin. Ask him to show you whatever will keep you from inheriting eternal life, inheriting the kingdom of God. For all your people, oh God, for this opportunity to come together, to join together in our places of comfort, Lord. And I just thank you for coming in and sup supping with us, oh God. Thank you for opening up our hearts and minds to receive your engrafted word. Thank you for your people, Lord, that's on the line, oh God. 
that push their way to come out to Bible study, Lord. And Father, I just thank you. And I ask that you would give them a special blessing, that you would touch their bodies, that you would heal them, that you would give them the wisdom, that when they open up your word, Lord, that they will be able to understand what the spirit of the living God is saying, Lord. And I just thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, until we meet again, Lord, I just thank you and I praise you. Y'all keep us up in prayer. God bless. Good night. This is the most critical part of the Bible study, of you hearing the word of God and being able to apply it to your life. This is the part where I introduce you to our Lord and Savior. So for anyone who would like to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, this is what I would like for you to pray. This is prayer for your salvation, to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Repeat these words. Lord, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose on the third day and ascended back to heaven. I know I am unable to live this life apart from you and I need the indwelling of your Holy Spirit to teach me, to guide me, and to all truth. Help me to live holy, upright, and be faithful to you. I invite you to be Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for saving me and writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Glory to God. If you've prayed that prayer, then your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I encourage you to tune in each Tuesday to our Bible study so that you can grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and the one who you now serve. And I welcome you into the family of God.